Good evening, everyone. Thank you for making the time to come out tonight. Um, as you may have heard and as we've emailed you, we're here tonight to try to answer some of your questions relative to the folks that actually flooded and are interested in elevation assistance or interested in the buyout. Uh, the city recently contracted with Jeff Ward of Jeff, Jeff Ward and Associates and Daniel Scott Engineering to help us evaluate the hazard mitigation grant program and apply on behalf of the residents for individual <coughs> assistance. Any program requires a local entity to make that application, so we need to partner together in order to secure any funding, if we're going to get any funding. Jeff's got a short presentation this evening to go through to explain the various programs to you and discuss the eligibility requirements. Uh, if you have any specific questions, we will take those questions tonight, as well as you can email them to us after the fact, and we can get you an answer back. Uh, but with that, I'll turn it over to Jeff and uh, let him take over. Good evening. Yeah, um, I'm going to ask that you hold questions until the end. That way I may address your questions as we proceed with the presentation, and we would not have had to stop for that. If you can't see the presentation, it's going to be sent out by email to everyone that signed up. It's going to be posted on city's website. city's website. So you'll have more than one opportunity to uh, go through this discussion and presentation. Give you a little bit of background about me and my company. I've been doing this for about 20 years and all I do is help communities recover for and prepare for disasters in the future. In fact, my first contract was with the city of Friendswood after Allison. So I was the person that managed and helped facilitate the acquisitions after Allison. I have gotten almost a billion dollars of FEMA grant funds for clients, all under these same programs that we're here to discuss today. <clears throat> That's all I do. I help communities get, go apply for these grants, help them manage the grants when they're awarded. <clears throat> I do it all over the United States. Most of my work has been in Texas. Um, for years, it was only in Texas, and then as flooding, fortunately for Texas, slowed down a bit, we got into other states that had the same needs, like after Hurricane Sandy, Katrina. I could go on and on, but I won't. My role tonight is not to discuss why people flood, how people flood, how often people flood, rather to talk about the programs to become available after people flood. This is a discussion about how you can mitigate a structure through an acquisition demolition project or an elevation project primarily. And unfortunately, part of the discussion will be the challenges associated with proving to FEMA that the funds should be spent on mitigating structures. It's not a panacea. It doesn't mean because you flooded or you think you might flood or you've had a small amount of flooding in the past that you're gonna be able to, uh, to meet the high bar of eligibility for these FEMA grants. There are some very specific requirements and I'll do my darndest to cover those and to explain why you may not be eligible and to explain why you may be eligible for inclusion in an application. So the first program I wanna talk, talk about or the only program tonight is the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. What does that mean to anybody? You'll hear me refer to it as HMGP. Hazard Mitigation Grant Program is the program that, is, that FEMA has that becomes available after a presidential disaster declaration like Hurricane Harvey. It's mad, mathematically determined how much money nation, uh, statewide they can apply for is based upon the total cost of the disaster. Harvey was a big disaster, as you certainly understand, and I'll cover some of the statistics associated with Harvey. Anyone interested in the, the information like the Stafford Act who administers it, but the important part is the total assistance that we're going to be able to apply for statewide, including Friendswood, is based upon a formula on how they determine how much money is going to be available based upon the size of the declaration. How much public assistance money was spent, how much individual assistance money was spent, how much sheltering was done, all those damages across the state from the event are totaled together. So here's some reference points. Allison, anyone dealt with that, generated mitigation money for communities to apply for in the range of 150 million. Rita made up about 220 million, that same calculation. Ike, about 440 million. Harvey, 1.1 billion. So the amount of money that is gonna be available for communities to apply for to do proactive mitigation projects to stop flooding in the future is $1.1 billion. All of the grants that are funded under the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program are funded by the federal government at 75% of whatever it is the total estimated project costs are. So if we submit an application, 
for acquisition of flood prone structures and flood damage structures, and we asked for the total cost of the application for the sake of discussion is $10 million. All the associated costs of acquisition, appraisals, administrative costs, demolition of structures, title, title and closing, $10 million, just as an example. FEMA will award $7.5 million, 75% of the total cost of the disaster. The 25% is local funded, and I'll explain the math, it would come from the homeowner's participation in the program. The, the cities don't have those kind of funds to generate to match that. It is something that they will pass along to the homeowners all that they get from the grant, so that they're not incurring any, the homeowners aren't incurring any cost under the grant side of it, and then anything else is made up by the homeowners. I'll, let me give you an example. Let me go through this first, and I'll give you an example of how that works out. This is the part that I start to talk about the challenges and the difficulties associated with getting these grants. In order to get funding under the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program, simple it must solve a problem it has to be something that is occurring that they would want to stop happening happening in the future <clears throat> this is the biggest hurdle we need, we will need to overcome it has to have a beneficial impact and i'll spend a lot more time on that in a couple of slides it must be cost effective the general accounting office says the fema will and omb will fund projects but you got to prove that if you spend a dollar of fema funds you'll save more than a dollar of future damages that is a very detailed calculation i'll explain how it's done and we do those calculations as part of this process. It must substantially, substantially reduce further risk, it must be environmentally sound. Most of the projects that we're dealing with with elevations or buyouts are environmentally sound. It's when you start doing other types of projects that there's questions, or if you're dealing with structures on the natural, natural register, they'd rather them be repaired than acquired and demolished if they're historic structures. So that would, that's an example of environmentally sound. All right, before I get into this discussion on benefit cost analysis, let me spend a little bit of time on this discussion about 100% project cost, 75% federal share, and 25% local share. The way a buyout, we'll start with a buyout. The way a buyout program works is that the property is appraised by a local state certified independent appraiser as if it had never flooded. So they look at the market just prior to Harvey, and they look at what comparable sales were, what friends what was doing market-wise at that time, and they do an estimate of the value of the home as if it was in an undamaged condition. They then deduct any post-flood structure money that was received for that damaged structure because we're assuming it wasn't damaged in the appraisal. Pre-flood value, post-flood structure damage money's paid, not content, structure only, deducted, you get a net. $300,000 appraised value, $150,000 worth of, let me do easy numbers. $300,000 appraised value, $100,000 insurance, you net at $200,000. The offer through the program is 75% of $200,000. You keep the flood insurance money you received, we net you at two hundred, dollars and then we deduct 25% of the $200,000, offer one fifty. dollars So in net, you're getting, do the math, two fifty dollars for that $300,000 structure. You're getting, keep your flood insurance, payment you received. If you spent any money of that structure payment for its intended purposes, muck out, you got people to come rip out the sheetrock, the carpet, all that stuff, and you keep receipts, that can be credited before the math is done. I will do, I'm not gonna go through 100 examples. 300,000, excuse me, minus 100 plus 20,000 that you put back into it, then 75% of that. So you get credit for what you have spent of that money that you receive for structure damage if it was used for its intended purposes. Now, there are other costs associated with demolition, I mean, excuse me, with acquisition demolition to include closing costs and demolition. Those are by far the lesser number, but those numbers, if you choose to participate, would come out of the net proceeds of closing to cover the 25% of those costs. So let's say everything else, demolition, closing cost, appraisal fee was $10,000. The grant would pay $7,500, and out of the closing of that $150,000 amount of money we were talking about, we would take out $2,500. Don't make me do that math again, because I did that out off my head, and I'll screw it up if I do it again. Elevation. If we were to ever get an elevation project, typically the structure money received for, the ele for flood damage isn't duplicative because you still need to do the interior repairs of your home. And the elevation isn't to buy out that structure and demolish it, it's to elevate that structure. And the cost of elevation, 
wasn't included in your structure payment. So typically, if we got a grant to elevate homes, and I'm currently elevating about 100, managing the elevation of about 150 homes throughout <coughs> Texas. Right now in Guadalupe County, we just finished Galveston County, we did League City, we're doing Nassau Bay. I manage those projects for communities. Elevations would be a $200,000 elevation. The grant pays 150, the homeowner would be out of pocket $50,000 for that elevation. As an example, if the cost of elevation was 200, and we got it approved, the grant would cover 150, the homeowner would cover 50 in that mathematical example. Typically, again, there isn't any of this deduction for flood insurance payments because we're not buying the structure, we're lifting the structure. You still gotta replace your cabinets and countertops and flooring, so it's not duplicative, if you will. All right, I'm not gonna try to work through that again. I recommend strongly is if we get through this process, we start working with individuals on grants and we get an award, I will sit down with each of you individually and talk specifically about your math. I wanna give you a general feel for now. There's no way to cover every scenario in a group this size mathematically in the next 10 hours probably. Okay, so I said I would talk about the challenges associated with getting this money. It's not a panacea. Just because you flooded doesn't mean that you're gonna be eligible. I don't mean you, I mean your home. We still have a burden of proof. The, most hard, the, the hardest burden of proof is benefit cost analysis. All right, what does this mean? We have to mathematically show FEMA that your historical losses or your depth in your floodplain will yield so many calculated future damages that it's worth spending the money on doing this today. And it's called a benefit cost analysis. And it's important to note, as one, again, I do a lot of math in this, I apologize ahead of time, but this home has experienced $200,000 of FEMA pay claims, okay? So let's say this home, we were gonna elevate this home and the cost of elevation was $200,000. In this mathematical example, they received a $50,000 payment five years ago, a $50,000 payment 10 years ago, a $50,000 payment 15 years ago, and a $50,000 payment 20 years ago. They've had four claims through the NFIP for $50,000 each. The net present value calculation of those avoided damages, when you bring the present value dollars of 50,000 five years from now, or five years in the past, 10 years in the past, 15 years in the past, and 20, is only $92,000. The model projects the net present value of future damages. So I, if I had a cost of an elevation on this home, that had four $50,000 losses, it wouldn't be cost effective. I couldn't meet that burden of proof. FEMA would say, you know what, we can't fund, OMB doesn't require us, allow us to spend 200,000 of FEMA grant money because the benefits are only $92,000. Again, I can't do a ton of examples, but the math behind this is what we need to do. All right, so let's say the math on historical losses doesn't work. We have a second way of running these benefit cost analysis. How deep does that home sit relative to how high it has to be? How deep in the floodplain is it? Mathematically, and I've done about 100,000 individual property BC benefit cost analysis. Mathematically, in order to be cost effective using the first floor elevation of the home from the elevation certificate relative to the elevation that it has to be, mathematically, if you're not sitting about eight foot deep in the floodplain, deeper than you need to be, you're not gonna be cost effective. Because the, if we can just use basic math, if the model says the home is sitting two foot below its required elevation, the required elevation is the 100 year event level, it may be sitting at the 75 year event level. What does that mean? It means mathematically it won't flood for 75 years. Not actually, but mathematically. So going back to this model, it would say it's gonna experience $50,000 damage way out here, or $100,000. When you bring that back, you're gonna end up in that 50, 60,000 of the benefits again. All right, are we done yet? No, we're not done because there's a third way to prove cost effectiveness. So the benefit cost analysis is avoided future losses have to be greater than the cost of doing the project. On average across all the homes in an application. FEMA software has to be used. There are two model types to use and a BCA has to be done on every structure. Every home individually has to, has to have a BCA done. 
I can aggregate homes and show that the overall cost and the overall benefits, benefits ex out, exceed the cost, even if one home is under. But for buyouts, for acquisition and demolition of a flood prone structure, if it's in the special flood hazard area, if it's in the FEMA map floodplain, there's a waiver. If the home is substantially damaged by the city, it's deemed cost effective. Everything else is done. We do not have to do a benefit cost analysis on that home. It's deemed cost effective. That is a waiver that often let, lets us buy out homes from a very severe event like a Harvey that mathematically isn't predicted to occur. You don't expect to get 50 inches of rain in the city of Friendswood in a two day period from an event like that. But because we did, if it's substantially damaged, it is deemed to be cost effective without all that mumbo jumbo behind the curtain crap that I discussed earlier. But it must be in FEMA's special flood hazard area in order to have that waiver. Or it, the average cost of acquisition has to be less than 276,000. I don't think we're gonna meet that threshold in Friendswood because I think the homes pre-flood are worth more than 275,000, 76,000 on average. But we can look at that. Those are the two waivers for homes in the floodplain. If you're not in the map floodplain, there are no waivers. You gotta go back to this, all that math and do the loss history and calculation of how many prior floods it's had and all the math that I showed earlier. Elevations is even tougher, guys. Elevations, there is no substantial damage waiver. The only time FEMA says, don't do a BCA, we'll tell you it's cost effective is if it's an acquisition demolition project for a substantial damage home in the floodplain. For elevations, there is a waiver that says if you can, acquire, if you can elevate homes on average for under 175,000, we'll call it cost effective. You don't have to do a BCA. People sitting in this room, I'm sure, have gotten quotes. Some people have gotten quotes on elevation. I can, I can almost guarantee the quotes you've gotten are to lift the home. That's different than elevating the home, FEMA compliant, with all of the costs associated with elevating the home. It is on average, and I'm managing now uh, uh, upwards of 500 elevations, on average, if you take the vertical footprint of a home, that's the slab size of the home, whatever needs to be lifted, a one-story home, it's gonna be over $100 a square foot for that vertical footprint. So if you have a 2,000 square foot home, that's a 200,000 square foot lift. On a, and it's, it can be substantially more than that. If it's a two-story home, if it's a brick home, it weighs more, it's gonna to have to have more footings, pilings, foundations. Very, very, very unusual, unless you have footprint homes of about 1,200 square foot to meet this threshold. I've tried it, we've done it, it doesn't work. So, the takeaway from that, if you're standing in this room or sitting in this room, I'm standing in the room, is it's, this is not an easy burden of proof. Will the city want us to look at anybody interested and see if it's cost effective? Absolutely. No one is not gonna be evaluated if the city says they're in the floodplain, they're interested in doing this, let's see what the model says, we'll look at it. That's my job. But I'm telling you, if you don't already know you're gonna meet one of those thresholds, you're not substantially damaged and interested in the buyout, it's gonna be an uphill battle. I can't change the guidance, I'm just telling you what it is. So I say, oh, and there's no, there, we're gonna talk briefly about mitigation reconstruction, which is demolishing and rebuilding a compliance structure. It is much, it is the, by far the most difficult of those three to prove, to prove cost effectiveness. And, and if I had a $300,000 buyout, if I had a $400,000 elevation, FEMA would fund that at 75%. If I have a $400,000 demo rebuild, FEMA would give you $150,000, so the rest is yours. They limit that federal share on mitigation reconstruction, demolishing and rebuilding that home to $150,000 federal share, that's it. But the burden of proof on mitigation reconstruction is significantly higher than any of the others because the cost is greater and the benefits are not any greater than the cost of the benefits associated with elevating a home. And there's no waiver for mitigation reconstruction. There have been about 20, homes, nationwide mitigation reconstruction homes funded through FEMA. I've done 10 of them, and they are not easy to prove. And in every one of those cases, the homeowners paid hundreds of thousands to rebuild the homes. If the, prop whoop, if the property does not meet any of the above requirements, we will need an elevation certificate from the homeowners if we want to do the BCA and or all of the, hi the historical pay claims on the home. We could work with you on getting the historical pay claims 
what FEMA has paid out because it's in a FEMA database the city has access to. We do not have your elevation certificate unless you've already filed it with the city for other purposes. But that's what is required if the property does not meet that substantial damage waiver. Or it has to have, well, it has to have an elevation certificate or, and or three prior paid flood claims. If you only had two paid flood claims and no elevation certificate, the benefit cost models don't run. They will not calibrate. They won't be, produce any results. If outside the floodplain, we can't, there's no elevation certificate outside the floodplain. There's no depth of water that it has to, depth of height of the home has to be, relatively speaking, with minimal permitting kind of exceptions. So we need that at least three prior flood losses to do that BCA. All right, now I've gotten through all the math, I think. We're gonna get into the types of projects and how they work. So let's assume we are able to prove cost effectiveness and you're interested and council says, you know what, we'll support that application. And we submit it and we get it approved. Now what happens? How does it work? We're gonna talk about home acquisition, demolition, and home elevation. You guys may be familiar with acquisition demolition because we did about 140 homes in Friendswood after Allison, and you see vacant lots in some of your neighborhoods from those programs. It is the acquisition of existing at-risk structures, demolishing of all improvements, and conversion to open space in perpetuity. The land can never be sold or redeveloped. Once it's acquired and owned by the city, it can never be sold or redeveloped. FEMA buyouts are strictly voluntary. I've heard rumors, and I hear these rumors all the time, and I started my first program, as I mentioned, was in Friendswood in 2001. There is no downside to being presented an offer in a FEMA mitigation program and declining it. You're not on a blacklist. You can still participate in a future program. We'll still come back to you in a meeting like this and say, you didn't do it in 2001, but you flooded again. Are you interested? Yes, you can still buy flood insurance. They cannot deny you flood insurance. They don't, we don't send a list to FEMA, nor do they want a list that says, we made this guy an offer, and he said, we made this woman an offer, and she said no. Therefore, you can't buy flood insurance. That is not true. If you've heard that from anybody, it's wrong. No homeowners are ever forced to sell. All the way up to the day of closing, you can change your mind. I've had people do that. You want to sell your house, you change your mind. You're able to get your sub dam reversed. You get a permit to repair. You can't find a replacement property. You want to stay. All those things are your right. You're upside down on your mortgage. You just can't get enough to pay off your mortgage, and they won't work with you on a short sale. Stay in your home. Accept the offer. I'm telling you what could, what could happen. Go all the way to the closing table. Get ready to sign the deed. Pull your pen away and walk away. No harm, no foul. It is a voluntary program start to finish. Likewise, no owner relocation assistance is provided in the program. It's not like Department of Transportation coming in and taking your home for a new highway and having to help you find a new home. It's a voluntary program on both ends of that equation. How does it work? State certified independent appraiser that knows how to appraise homes appraises your home as if it were not damaged. People look at me like, well, how do they do that? Well, they do it all the time, post fires as an example. They look at a home and they look at the day before the, the damage occurred and they look at what the market was doing and they look at a four bedroom, three and a half bath home on a half an acre of land with a two car garage and they figure out similarities and differences and they say, okay, given the market over the past six months or a year prior to the Harvey, this is what that home likely would have sold for. They do an appraisal of the property. Pre-flood value duplication of benefits deductions. That is the post-flood structure money deducted and then credits for that money being spent with receipts on it for its intended purposes. We generate an offer, you look at the appraisal, state requires an appeal process. If the appraisal comes in at 250,000 and you really felt pre-flood was worth 275 and you really want to take another shot at this, get a second appraisal done at your expense. It's an appeal process. We'll evaluate that. If it warrants a move in value, we move, we'll move the value. One shot appeal process. Owner paying the independent appraisal, state has final say in value. If you're interested in a buyout program and you think you're gonna qualify and you think you have title issues, try to work to get them resolved today or soon. Bad transfer of title between heirs when there was a passing, something that cr puts a cloud on the title, we cannot buy the property if we can't get clear title to the property. So I give people with a heads up, two big heads ups. If you spend, whether you're in this buyout program, whether you're in an elevation program, whether you walk out of this room and never talk to us again, keep every receipt for every penny you spend on your house, 
keep it in a Ziploc baggie in someone else's house that doesn't flood up high, keep it out of the way, and um, make sure your title's clear. Work on it now if you think you're going to be in the program. Properties must be vacated at the time of closing. I'm telling you how it works if we got a grant and you're going through the program. So you get time. We, we don't tell you when you're going to close. You tell us when you want to close. We work the title issues. We get the money ready. And we're ready to go to closing upon your ability to vacate the property. If you never got back into it, that's probably sooner than later. All personal property you want out is out. You can't return to the property after closing because it becomes the title of the city. And it's, you know, it, there's a, a liability and risk associated with returning to the property. Likewise, when you get a pre-flood value for the value of the home, you can't salvage from the home. You can't take the doors, the cabinets, the countertops, the plumbing fixtures. Everything remains on the property. <coughs> Owner receives the net proceeds at closing after we pay up. The, all that comes out of your offer, other than the 25% discussions we had, are your mortgage amount and any taxes due and payable up to the day of closing, or any other liens that someone might have placed on your property. I hope no one in this room has large federal tax liens, but they carry with the property and we got to close them out. So uh, we'll do a full title search and get by a title policy. All those costs are covered by the grant at 75%. I mentioned the FEMA deed restrictions. Anyone that wants to see the deed restrictions can go to FEMA.gov and look up model deed restrictions to see what the deed restrictions are. But suffice it to say, open space in perpetuity, nothing built on it ever again. I mean, you can put a, a swing set, you can put things consistent with park use, a park bench, but nothing insurable that's going to flood. Demolished buildings clear the sites. Everything comes off. Utilities are capped. Well, uh, septics are crushed and filled if there's a septic tank. Uh, wells are capped according to state law. Sites are clear. From appraisal to closing, we can get this done in as quick as 90 days, sometimes even sooner. It doesn't have to be a long, drawn-out process. If there's clear title and the owner's ready to close, we can get it done quickly. I, we, after Allison, we got a grant, and two months later, we were closing properties, once the grant was approved. Elevations. This is one of the most common, becoming one of the most common forms of retrofitting. But if you go to League City, and you go to Nassau Bay, and you go to Galveston County, and you go to Guadalupe County, You'll see these homes, if you see them being elevated, and I'll show you some pictures, 95% of them are going up 10 feet in the air. And the reason for that isn't because they want to go up 10 feet in the air, it's because that's the kind of lift that makes them cost effective. If they're not sitting, if they only have to go up three or four feet, they're probably not at risk enough. They're at risk. Not at risk enough to meet the FEMA grant requirements for eligibility, benefit cost analysis. When a house is properly elevated, the living area will be above all but the most severe floods. That's kind of an obvious statement. We lifted the, the free board, the additional requirement above FEMA minimum requirement in the city of Friendswood is two feet. So I would imagine two feet above the required 100-year elevation is probably close to the 500-year elevation. We have gotten FEMA, I don't want to go way off tangent here, we have gotten FEMA to agree to fund the highest prior known flood level if you receive more water than the two-foot freeboard. They have funded projects where they said, well, why put them back in a, in a position where they have flooded previously depth-wise? Let's put them up to that higher level. There's a limit to that, but it's a discussion we are allowed to have. Ten years ago, I wouldn't be standing in front of you talking about elevations, and I certainly wouldn't manage elevations. It was a nightmare. And the, fir the first one that we even looked at was in um, Jersey Village. And the company was a house leveler, which in the Houston area, there were many house slab levelers that would go in and kind of tweak the slabs and move them around a bit. Um, the first one that was tried to lift that wasn't in Jersey Village, just cracked the slab in half. The home was you know, worthless at that point. Today. The technology and the manpower and the equipment that's invested in by these elevation firms, these multi-million dollar uh, unified jacking systems is phenomenal. They can lift anything. I've not seen a home that can't go up. And you'll see there's some homes in Friendswood that were lifted in the Galveston County program. Um, most of the homes we lift are slab on grade. The benefit of a slab on grade lift is everything that's inside the home, your kitchen cabinets and countertops and your flooring systems and your plumbing systems remain. The floor is the floor when it's lifted. Slab separating is where you cut the house off of the slab and everything comes out. You elevate the home and then build a flooring system and then the homeowner has to go back and finish everything back off again. 
that's nowhere near as effective as lifting the slab and letting the slab be the foundation system of the elevated structure minus the piers, post pylons, and steel beams. Projects must be cost effective. The elevation methods are continuous foundation wall, a chain wall around the home with flood vents or piers, posts, and pilings. Most of your high lifts are on piles, piers, or posts. Everything you see, beach, beach kind of elevations, and most of your lower lifts are on continuous chain wall or like a crawl space under a home. The benefits are driven, again, by prior flood loss or depth in the floodplain. The costs are driven by the method of elevation which are almost all the same now, but if it's a slab separation, it's different than a slab elevation, the lift height and the vertical <laughs> footprint. The higher you go, incrementally foot-wise, the more expensive it is uh, after the first initial lift of about four feet, and then the vertical footprint is the big driver. And a two-story is more than a one-story, a brick home is more than a uh, wood frame home. Eligible costs are everything, you can read this, everything associated with lifting the home, getting ingress and egress back, disconnect and reconnect the utilities. Those are the eligible costs of elevation, just to make them short and simple. Restoring land, lawn, walks, driveways, and other surfaces that had to be cut in order to tunnel under the home. What they literally do is they tunnel under the home in key spots, tunnel under with men, run I-beams, and then set up these jacking systems to lift the home up and then build the foundation system under that elevated home. They don't take the home from here, put it here, build a system and put it back. They lift the home in place. What it doesn't do is make it real pretty when you're done. We don't chip the slab underneath and fill it all in. They don't paint the fascia around the bottom. If it's on a chain wall, FEMA guidance says unfinished concrete. HOA says stuccoed, painted, then you stucco and paint it consistent with your HOA, but not the grant. Grant will elevate your home, disconnect, reconnect the utilities, give minimum ingress and egress, minimum code compliant ingress and egress back. All right, we're gonna take questions, but what's next? Well, first we need to know who's interested and what they're interested in. And, and realize the limitations of what I told you before I think the city's willing to have us look at eligibility for every home that is interested in applying for an application, but whether you get on an application is going to be dependent upon all the stuff I've talked about up until now. In addition, once we complete the benefit cost analysis, we know what you're interested in, the management staff's going to go back to council and say, this is what we got, this is who's interested, and they'll have to get council approval to finish and submit an application. It's not my decision. And it's probably not the final decision of anybody but council. We'll submit an application for the interested cost-effective homes, submit the application by the due date, and wait for the results of the review. I anticipate if we were to get an application in two months from now, maybe hearing a month and a half after that, they are moving quickly. There's a billion dollars, 1.1 billion dollars available in this program, and they can make awards because the money is already available. So, it doesn't need to be a long, drawn-out process. We've all waited long enough thus far. To nobody's fault other than this, it was a big disaster and it takes a long time to get to the bureaucracy. In fact, by the way, if you look back at, read, uh, at Ike, applications weren't even allowed to be submitted, excuse me, they were allowed to be submitted. They weren't reviewed until one year after the declaration. So they're moving ahead of, they're moving, they've moved the timeline for Harvey up so I'm gonna give you a couple before and after shots on elevation. That's a home, that's the, that's the slab of the home, well that's the patio outside the slab of the home. That's the slab of the home right there, can you see that? It's a two story home, that's a deck on the second story of the home and it's sitting right on one of the creeks. It's in Galveston County. I went into that home and about right here on the home was a line that said Ike stopped here. <laughs> so maybe nine foot deep in the home. That's the home elevated. Interestingly enough, they were able to take that deck, detach it from the home, lift the home, and now the, now the deck is a one foot step down, one step down from the house. So they were able to keep the deck as ingress and egress to the back side of the house, raise the upper porches by extending the post to pylons, and then, then they were able to tie the foundation piling systems together with a, with a uh, slab that tied everything together for vertical torquing. That's about a nine foot lift. You can see the guy there working on the AC. 
This is a home in Pensacola Beach, Florida we recently did. It's a little concrete bunker, one story home sitting at six foot above mean sea level right on Pensacola Beach, Florida. That's home elevated about eight, no, that's, ten, that's a 10 foot left. They span these to be able to park underneath of them. There's the primary parking here. You can see the deck going up the back right there. Uh, and then they added this catwalk across the front with a, with a wrap around to that. This was a, a garage, I think. I'd have to go back. Um, I'm not sure why that's not closed off. I forget what they did with that. I apologize. He put it up for sale as soon as he finished it. This is a, a small, this is a very small footprint home. It doesn't look like it, but this was one of those ones that qualified under the 175 limit, and it was a very small lift. That's the slab there. That's the elevated chain wall once it's lifted with flood vents around the sides of it. This is my favorite one, by the way. This is in League City, and I got permission from the owner to share this one because he's standing. This is a two-story home. It may be him there, but I don't remember. That's the bottom level, and their living area was on this bottom level, and this was the kitchen, living room, area, dining room upstairs. So they're all their bedrooms on the bottom level. That's him waving after we elevated this home 13 feet. Now, Harvey was a really big flood, as you guys well know. And I got an email from this owner with pictures right after Harvey, who the e email made it up to the National Office, one of those very touching things, thanking me for helping them with this and for saving their life. And I didn't do anything to save the life, of course. I wasn't there for the event. But that's the picture of their home. In the middle of the night, Harvey ra rose 12 feet in the middle of the night while they were sleeping. They woke up to that water all the way up into the bottom level of their home. Now, I say Harvey was a big event because that home, unfortunately, still flooded, even though it was two foot above BFA, but it got that much water in it. How, was their li how were their lives saved? They were in sleeping in this level here. They would have been on the ground, and that water rose 12 foot in about an hour and a half or two hours while they were sound asleep. So Harvey just blew into this area. That is them taking a picture from the rescue boat back looking at their house. That's the depth of water. It didn't get any higher. They were to move back into their house after a little bit of muck out. That home would have been gone, and they would have probably perished. I was asked to highlight the fact that even elevations, you know, buyouts are an interesting animal because it's the only mitigation that's 100% effective, right? There's nothing there. So I mentioned that one home in League City that flooded after Harvey but didn't get much water, and there were many homes that were elevated that flooded. I mean, it was a huge event. So you'll never get it completely out of harm's way, and everybody that had a car underneath their home lost their cars, lost their vehicles. I mean, the only per permanent form of mitigation is buyouts. I don't want to oversell them, but I want to be clear that you can still flood when you're elevated. All right. All right, so the question was, first question was of substantial damage, and how does a city determine substantial damage if FEMA doesn't, I think was what the question was. The FEMA contractors did an initial assessment of your home based upon an exterior inspection. They had contractors go drive by the homes that were impacted and estimated that if the floodwaters got yay high, that you had about X percent damage based upon the footprint of your home. We did further inspections at visiting individually with homeowners that had come in to pull permits or had engaged us to do those inspections. The difficulty that we have, obviously, is if you're substantially damaged and your house isn't two feet above the 100-year base flood elevation, you can't reoccupy your home without it elevating. But you may not qualify for one of these assistance programs. So substantial damage was based on the initial FEMA inspection plus a further inspection by our inspectors. If you haven't been further inspected by our inspectors, you need to come to the Community Development Department and pull a permit, and we'll do that further inspection. At the end of the day, though, we're going to find a way to work with you so that you're not left in, uh, in the limbo to where you don't qualify for an assistance for elevation, but you're substantially damaged and you can't reoccupy your home without elevating. I do want to highlight also, if it's, if it's important to note, that if you are in the map floodplain, which is where you should be if you were determined substantially damaged, you do autumn, well, excuse me, you do meet the threshold of eligibility for a buyout. Not an elevation, but a buyout. So you had a second question, you said. Next question so the question was, are you going to prioritize substantial damage homes when it comes to the grant? I'm repeating it so that the camera can hear it when he rebroadcasts everything, if you're wondering why I'm doing that. Um, I think FEMA prioritizes that as the state does, and it's the, if it's for buyouts, it's the guaranteed eligibility requirement not funding, eligibility. So if you're substantially damaged and we submit your home for buyout, 
you're deemed cost effective. So by definition, in my opinion, it's prioritizing. I also believe there's enough money in Ike that every eligible project for buyouts of homes that are substantially damaged would be able to be funded statewide because there's so much money available. Substantial damage doesn't qualify for elevation. So what's going to qualify for elevation is benefit cost analysis. So if you're not cost effective, the fact that you're substantially damaged doesn't buy us anything from a prioritization perspective for elevations. I'll go back and say I would like to make the assumption that if homeowners are interested, I'm going to, I'm going to make an assumption. If homeowners are interested in elevations and we can qualify them to meet the benefit cost analysis, then the city is likely going to support an application for any one of those homes, not just for a prioritized set of homes. I understand, but if it's not cost effective, I can't get you a grant. I can't get a grant for home that needs to be elevated that's not cost effective. So let's say as an example, uh, let me use a mathematical example, and I do want to be clear on the challenges we face, and I do want to highlight the city said they will work with you on your repair estimates, on your values, to kind of make certain that it's substantially damaged. The more certain you are, the more likely it might be cost effective, but let me give you an example. Let's say you're one foot below the base level elevation, one foot below the base level elevation, or, or even one foot below the two foot freeboard, which means you're one foot above the base level elevation. If Harvey's the only time you flooded, I can guarantee you, unfortunately, that you'll never be cost effective because it's not deep enough in the floodplain to warrant even running a BCA. One loss, one foot above BFE, the model would project $1,000 of the future damages mathematically in this complicated model, homes in Galveston County that are on an application and are getting funded, homes in Nassau Bay, homes in Galveston, Guadalupe County are eight foot below BFE. That's kind of the depth of water that it takes in order to be cost effective. So you are in a precarious situation where you're substantially damaged, have to bring your home into compliance, and may not qualify for a grant. That is going to happen. There's no doubt in my mind. And that's why we want to work with you on an individual basis so where you're not left without any assistance and then you can't reoccupy your home. So, But I, if, I, if there's no other takeaway, as harsh as this may be, and I'm not trying to be the bearer of bad news, I'm trying to be the bearer of realistic news, as harsh as it may be, elevation is a hard threshold to meet from a FEMA grant perspective. And just because you flooded in Harvey and are slightly below BFE or required elevation, means you're likely not going to qualify for an elevation grant. So please walk away from this meeting with that understanding, unfortunately. I'm going to go here, and then I'll come back to you. Yeah. If, if, you were, if your address was listed in the newspaper as substantially damaged, but you've never been notified and you have a permit to rebuild, and you're basically back in your house, if what is that? You're good to go. You reoccupy your home. We issued you a permit. Yeah. We, we are not substantially damaged. The yes. newspaper article was worthless. Thank you. <laughs> so he said, is this going on right now, or do we have to wait another seven months like we did on the buyout? What buyout are you referring to, sir? I was, on, I was supposed to be on the original buyout, then I found out. What original buyout are you referring to? Water development. Oh, I understand. The, the flood mitigation assistance grant. Um, the state of the, the Texas Division of Emergency Management has made it clear they will accept applications as soon as possible and will fund them quickly. So. I don't think it's going to take anywhere near seven months. The TWDB, Texas Water Development Board, FMA, Flood Mitigation Assistance Application, I'm going to get to your question. Hold on, let me, I'm not done. I'm, I will I promise I'll get to you. That application was a national review on a very limited pot of money, a national review for every 33,000 communities across the United States. I submitted 45 million in applications nationwide, just me, for my clients. It's a very competitive process, a long, much longer time frame process. This is a, that was $150 million nationwide. This is $1 billion in the state of Texas alone. The likelihood of funding is 10 times more and quicker in this program. So what was your follow-up question? So that's a great question. If you tell me, um, yeah, 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 but, uh, um, so, you're, very likely, you're very likely eligible because you were eligible for the FMA, which means you were substantially damaged. So I, I went through this whole discussion for half of the presentation about substantial damage determination as a waiver for cost effectiveness for a buyout. If you got a substantial damage determination and, it was, and it's still valid, 
then you would be eligible for buyout through a waiver and there would be no benefit cost analysis required. And I can explain that in more detail separately later. So the key information is when you, when you first came in and some people were already in, we asked, you to, we asked you for your name, your address, and your contact information. That's what we would need to be able to get back in touch with you regarding your desire to be part of the program. So you're going to call us and we're not to call you? Who are you pointing, him? She's, she's asking me. So my name is Patrick Donner. I'm the floodplain administrator. So that's why I was asking for everybody that came up, and, I, and some of you had already came into the courtroom before, I, before our, I came out to the front. That's why I was asking for your name, your address, and your contact information. So after this meeting, one of the things I'll do, there's some forms that I'll send out. There's a link to this same presentation that you just saw, in case you missed something, want to see it again, that I'm going to send out to you. And what I, what I will need from you is information as far as is this, are you looking for elevation assistance? Or are you wanting to be bought out for that free residence? Those are the two things that I'll need to know. And I will say there's a bunch of people in this room and there's a bunch of people that already left. So please bear with me if I don't get back with you the next day or so. It is gonna take time to go through all of the correspondence. It, so if you could first, the, the question, so that I can repeat it for him, the question had to do, I can't repeat the whole thing, the question had to do with the FEMA map floodplain and the, the difference in change, the potential changes in maps from uh, when it was purchased to where we are today. And in short, the, your lending institution, when you purchased your home, had looked at the wrong maps. FEMA had indicated that the city of Friendswood was under the 1999 maps and Harris County side of Friendswood, Correct. despite us being under the 2007. So as a matter of assistance to our homeowners, and I want, if you don't take anything away tonight, I want you to take away the fact that the city will try to do whatever we can to put you in the mo give you the most options. We reverted back to the 1999 maps Correct. to help you have more flexibility. Which changed our ability to what we ended up doing was rebuilding our home because we were not going to be eligible for any FEMA grant money because we weren't considered in the floodplain because of the 99 map. Correct? That is correct. Okay. But even with this, even if we apply for this, I, Jeff nor I can guarantee you will get these funds Okay. until so, it's awarded. So. If, if, if you want to put yourself in a position, we can use the we can use the 07 maps for an application if you're interested. But I can't guarantee I you'll mean, get funds. We, we put it, you know, like a hundred thousand dollars in the home fixing it now. So, you know, but I was interested potentially if there was a grant money available. Maybe now, you know, maybe we should go come go ahead and raise the house. We paid a professional engineer to come do an elevation certification for our home, and we're like two feet below the BFE. And I think friends would be supposed to be two feet above the BFE, so we're like, you know, four feet in, right. in danger or whatever. I can certainly do a benefit cost analysis on your, on your home, but I can tell you intuitively it's not going to be cost effective to elevate. Because? Because you're not sitting, sitting not deep enough in the floor. Correct. That's correct. Okay. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, I had two questions. Could I need that to finish that off? So the flood map that the and FEMA are in sync with is the 2000, I mean the 1999 map is what we're currently the, the, 19, the, the current map for the city of Friendswood, whether you're in Harris County or Galveston County, is the 1999 map. That is the only map that is recognized by FEMA. Okay. The question was, did I say in my presentation, if someone spent some of their, I'm going to paraphrase your question, structure payment received, and we deduct some, all the structure payment, could they get credited for that? The answer is, if it were used for its intended purposes, okay. yeah, so, and I, let me just clarify that just to, so to be clear, because I've done a lot of D DOB, duplication of benefits calculations. I've had homeowners say, well, I bought a new home and I used that insurance to buy a new home. That's not the intended purposes. Or I paid off my credit cards or I had to pay off my car. It's for, you receive structure damage and you hired a company to come and clean up all your sheetrock and carpet and you paid, you know, you paid Surpro $10,000 to keep that receipt, prove its payment. When you, we do the $300,000, a pre-flood value, $100,000 worth of insurance deduction, then we credit $10,000 back. What about minor repairs? For instance, sheetrock being 
Did, so the only gray area, and I'm not an investigative reporter when it comes to this, so I don't like dig too deep. If you, there's, there's always this kind of gray area, and I think everybody in this room is going to understand this. If you were substantially damaged in the floodplain, and then you did repairs on the permit, is that creditable? So no, but the answer is that it's a very gray area because the question is, did you do repairs that you weren't supposed to do? So we've had people go in and fully repair their home without a permit and say, well, where is my credit for my deduction? Well, you never pulled a permit. You weren't supposed to repair. It's a real gray area. So that's the only caveat to answer your question. Okay. Then my second part is, how do you apply? How do I get an application? The, so let me be real clear about something, and we'll cover this again. I hope it does. I don't care if I have to say it again, so please don't take it that way. There are forms that are required for an application. One is called a notice of voluntary interest, where you sign up saying, I want to be, I, I understand it's voluntary, and I know the city can't take my home in domain, and I'm interested in a buyout program. There's a citizenship form that needs to be completed. There are photos of the property that we need to get. I don't want to go over everything, because I'm not trying to get you to write it down. Patrick will send those things out and say, OK, if you're interested, provide these forms to us. That'll come to me. And then we'll do the benefit cost analysis, ask that there's a subdam determination letter, figure out if they're interested in, I did that in reverse order, buyout or elevation, is there a subdam letter? Then I would start working with you guys to collect other information and kind of take the burden off the city for the really specific data I need for the application. So we have time. You didn't need to bring anything tonight. Tonight is a, a meeting to tell you what's going on have you go away with enough information that when you get those forms, you can fill them out and say, yeah, I want to, I, please consider me and do my BCA for an acquisition or an elevation. How, or how do I find out my elevation? How do I f obtain an elevation certificate? And do I, does my house qualify if I have a detached garage? Or would the garage qualify if the house qualifies? OK. All right, so here, here we go. Um, you find out your elevation by getting a surveyor to do an elevation certificate on your property. If you're in the MAP floodplain, in my recommendation, it's always helpful to have an elevation certificate. If you haven't yet been asked by your flood insurance adjust, uh, adjuster or writer to get one, you're going to over the next couple of years anyway, because they're, re they're rating flood insurance policies on the risks of the properties based upon depth of floodplain. So it's probably good to get an EC elevation certificate anyway. Um, no, we will not elevate a detached garage. Detached garages are compliant on the ground. We're not going to elevate anything that's compliant on the ground. Yes, you probably have some coverage in your flood policy for the detached garage, but only as a portion of the building damage that might occur to the building. So once the home is elevated, your garage would flood on its own without the building, without the house flooding. It would no longer qualify for flood payments. So it's, it's compliant on the ground. The question she asked was, I, got a, I want to know the difference between elevation and lift, or lift and an elevation. Um, and what is included in the lift different on the grant than if I included uh, a, got a price for a lift. What I'm trying to say is I've heard people come to me and say, I had someone come out and quote lifting my house for $50,000. And I say to them, that's probably just someone physically lifting the home and doing nothing else to it. Not disconnecting, reconnecting the utilities, not building stairs, not building the piling system or the foundation wall, just physically lifting the home. So don't think you're going to get away for an elevated home for $50,000. When we, when a grant elevates the home, and it, the grant elevation is no different than any other elevation the city would require from a permitting perspective, at the end of the day, it's got to be the same. It's got to be code compliant. It's got to have you know, all the electricity and plumbing and get an occupancy permit. What I'm saying is when we hire elevation companies, they're general contractors. They're required to put in pl engineering plans on everything from the lift to the foundation to the utilities to ingress and egress. That is running well over $100 a vertical footprint of your home. So if you said to me, I have a 2,000 square foot footprint home, and someone told me they lift it for $100,000, I would say, I bet you ain't getting a fully lifted co-compliant home that you get ingress and egress to. I don't know what you mean by the fence. I think you're referring to a, a chain wall around the foundation. So you probably have a four foot lift. No, there's actually recommending, I think, six or eight feet. Okay. Well, you can't do a chain wall once you break six feet. You can't, I mean, it, the, 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 you really can't build a, elevate a home and have anything other than like a three sided enclosure for aesthetic purposes. The foundation system, once you break four feet, and I'm not an engineer, roughly speaking, you're going to have piers, posts, and pylons. Whether they skirt that is a whole different discussion. So 
the smaller lifts, four or five feet, they typically are supported on a footer in the ground with concrete blocks and rebar inside of that is the foundation system. Once you go beyond that, you're on piers, posts, and pilings almost every time. The question was relative to a townhouses that were four to, a, uh, four to a unit, the four units per townhouse block, three story townhomes, um, and is it worth even going through an elevation process for those? First, let me answer that first. First, all four owners would need to be interested, right? Because you can't separate the townhomes. We're doing a uh, condo, we tried to do a condo complex in League City of seven homes. Two story, not three story. They were cost effective, but they had nine feet of water in them multiple times into the second level. All right, so those homes are cost effective. But two of the owners didn't participate, so we've converted that over to an acquisition demolition project. There's just no way to do it because everybody wasn't participating and you really can't separate the units. Okay, so, um, but, so I, I'm gonna make the assumption, and I, it's a, sometimes I make bad assumptions, that if it's a three-level townhome, your kitchen and, uh, main living areas on the second floor and your bedrooms on the third floor and the bottom level is a parking garage or some parking structure and probably a small living uh, living area likely not cost effective because you have such little at-risk square foot footprint your mechanical systems except for your hot water heater and your hvac which are on the lower level maybe are getting flooded but really no living area so hard to prove cost effectiveness unless you got to go up about nine or ten feet and you're getting water in the second floor of the home on a Flood basis. Actually, we did. Uh, okay. We didn't actually specifically, but the building next to us did, and we, we were very close. It, so when I answer questions, I still am more than willing to run the BC. I'm asking from I'm answering from experience, and experience would say, from what we just described, probably not. Okay. But let's run it. Uh, the second half of my question, you mostly answered already, but no, I'm going to move more towards the buy outside. Uh, you mentioned you said uh, that you can't do the elevation if it's not all four. Uh, you know, all four. Uh, interested in it? Can you do any? It, it, can you do any of these without all four owners? It, it, it's a sticky wicket um, to go through that process. So I want to also make the assumption that if you're going to get under the 276 threshold anywhere in Friendswood, you might do it in a in a small townhouse complex on a per unit basis, uh, as opposed to single family on a larger lot because you don't have the value of the land like you do in some of the more expensive areas of Friendswood. So it's probably more likely that if it was, if there is substantial, well, if they were substantially damaged or in the map floodplain and collectively under 276 and the city supported it, we could probably get that to work. It's almost impossible to take out homes and leave anything else because you've got a common wall between them. So uh, instinctively, no, but on honestly, we've done it once before where we actually were able to separate the one in unit home from the other three and have that one wall resurfaced, but it's really tough. So the question was, I have heard there's ICC money and can that be applied by homeowners to, I think I'm saying it's right, to the 25%. So remember I said earlier that I have, I've pretty much finished my math. Um, I will now go back into math. Uh, and, and ICC is a wonderful mathematical calculation for homeowners. Increased cost of compliance is only available for homes that are in the map floodplain that have insurance. So, I mean, I guess that's an obvious statement. If you don't have flood insurance, then you don't have ICC coverage. It's called increased cost of compliance or coverage D of your flood policy. In the map floodplain, you have ICC. Some of the homes in the preliminary floodplain aren't required to buy flood insurance, theoretically, and therefore, if they do buy flood insurance, the coverage D is not in their policy. I've seen it time and time again. Even though they buy flood insurance, they're not in a special flood hazard area and it doesn't come with ICC. So let's make sure we limit that. And I can review with you. We're answering this one. I'll get it to you, I promise. Um, so, but the answer to your question is ICC can be used to offset the local match for the homeowners. It's called assignment of coverage D. So if you were to participate, let's start off with a buyout program. And at the time of the offer, you and I discussed the increased cost of compliance process and you didn't like I said, I didn't want to get into math again. And you didn't maximize your flood insurance payment at 250. Because ICC is part, of, is, is ca your total flood insurance payment on a given loss is capped at 250. So if you got 248, you only have $2,000 left of ICC coverage available to you. So assuming you didn't exceed your full, you didn't hit your full limit on your coverage, 
and assuming you're in the MAP floodplain and assuming you participate in a buyout program, we would file a claim after demolition to recover as much of the demolition cost that you bore, or much of the 10% of your cost, as much of the $30,000 they would, that they would pay, and then refund that to you once it's received. There's a lot of caveats to that because ICC is a flood claim, and you've dealt with flood adjusters, and it's not a given that you're going to get XYZ number of dollars every time you file a claim. I've had adjusters say, yes, it can be used as local match against the owner's 25%, but only 25% of demolition because demolition is the only eligible portion of a buyout relative to ICC. I've had others say, well, wait, mathematically, it's fine. I can give you the full 30,000 because the owner spent to, accepted 150 of a $200,000 value. That way, he put in 50,000, we'll give you the full 30. And I've had some, well, wait a second, there was asbestos in the home, and when you demolish a home with asbestos, asbestos isn't part of ICC, therefore I'm not paying any of it. I filed about 1,200 ICC claims for local match, and they've ranged from 30,000 to nothing. I can't control that, but we would file it. Now let's move to elevation. 100% of the cost of elevation is ICC eligible because that's one of the things you do with ICC money. Therefore, every time we've had a local match requirement on a substantially damaged home, if I didn't say that, in order to be qualified for ICC, you have to be substantially damaged. If you're not substantially damaged, you do not qualify for ICC. But I've never filed an ICC claim on, an, on a substantially damaged home that was elevated that didn't get the full $30,000. Ta-da. So yeah, that's how that works. Does the uh, on elevation, will the, will the grant pay for an elevator? If you have fill out the state forms for ADA requirements, the answer is yes. If, is uh, CDBG funding eligible to be a local match for the, for the, for the grant that you're talking very, about? Very good question. So community Development Black Grant funds are CDBG DR money that's coming to the state of Texas. It's going to be substantially more than the I know you guys are so excited about more acronyms. Community Development Block Grant Disaster Recovery, CDBGDR. Um, if I didn't repeat the question, I apologize. The question was, um, I forget the first part of the question. First part was about elevators. Will the grant pay for an elevator? And my answer was, if you have ADA needs, America with Disability Act needs, and you fill out the proper forms, you get the doctor to certify the need, the grant would pay for an elevator or I should say a lift, a minimum code compliant lift to get you. If you're, by the way, whatever the minimum ADA, whatever meets the minimum ADA needs is what you'd get. You can get a ramp if it's a small lift. So yeah, just to clarify, a lot, a lot of times this stuff comes back to bite me if I say, yeah, you can get an elevator, and then the answer is no, you can get a lift. I didn't mean that. All right, CDBG, the other question was, can CDBG, Community Development Block Grant Money, be used as a local match to offset the 25%? The answer that I'm giving every community that I talk to is, I have no idea what CDBG is going to allow until the administrative plan is finalized through the GLO and the COGS. And that will probably occur, I don't know this, I'm not criticizing anybody, after we've already begun the HMGP grant. My experience with CDBG is it's never retroactive. You can't go back and get CDBG money to apply to unmet 25% after the fact. So I think HMGP money will be made available a well ahead of CDBG. CDBG, Community Development Block Grant money, typically has some very strict LMI, low to mod income requirements associated with it. And typically cities like Friendswood that are more affluent don't often don't qualify for CDBG funds. So I can't answer any better than that other than I don't know. It's a long I don't know, but I didn't want to just say I don't know. I'm glad to hear that you were here for Allison. Uh, in Harris County, uh, Friendswood, uh, almost 40% of the buyouts had never flooded before. Is the, the benefit to cost analysis the same today as it was then? Substantial damage determination waiver was used in the 2001 event. One lost home, substantial damage in the floodplain qualifies without a BCA. Same as Harvey. So I spent a lot of the first part of the presentation saying the waiver for, for buyout benefit cost analysis is a substantial damage determination. Same thing in Allison. That's how those homes were bought with one loss events. The question was, how is this going to play when FEMA starts classifying homes as repetitive losses or repetitive loss? 
So yeah, I, I, yeah, I think I understand your question. Um, I'm not sure when you say how's this going to play. Uh, nothing with what we're doing changes relative to the classification of the property. Hazard mitigation grant program funds, you don't even need to be insured in order to be eligible. So severe repetitive loss, for those of you who don't know, are four or more losses of at least $5,000 or two or more losses exceeding the value of the building. I won't do any math for you. Um, in, in, when, you when you get categorized as severe repetitive loss, there are more grant opportunities in the future that become available if this one doesn't work out. And the federal percentage of those grants actually changes depending on the classification of those properties. We're not here talking about the severe repetitive loss. There is no severe repetitive loss program. It's called the Flood Mitigation Assistance Program. But the city will likely consider applying for that severe repetitive loss funded kind of program under flood mitigation assistance in the future if it opens up again. And the homes that are our severe repetitive loss would potentially qualify, but that's one of the many options the city will continue to look at in my humble opinion about applications. But nothing changes relative to classification. So if this flood makes you severe repetitive loss, that will long-term change your flood insurance rates and things of that nature. It may encourage you to participate in the program now, and it will certainly open up avenues in the future for, for additional programs if you choose not to participate in HMGP, but it doesn't affect where we are today. But if you're severe repetitive loss and you don't qualify for these kind of things right now... Sure you do. Absolutely you do. There's nothing that... There, I'll say again, your classification of a property has zero impact on this program we're talking about. Whether you are or are not doesn't change your everything eligibility is what I discussed earlier, not the classification of the property. It doesn't change. No, so he asked, he's interested in participating in the buyout application. Is there anything else he needs to know today? Or can he gracefully, gracefully leave? We need nothing else tonight. First part of the question is I take into account what happened when we do the benefit cost analysis and we take into account what happened in the past, will it take into account what happens in the future? That's the definition of doing a benefit cost analysis. I can't project the future, but the model projects his history as the future. So it'll say, it'll say, I'm going to get a little bit technical here. Let's use the loss history. So if you had a loss in 79, 2001, 2008, and 2017, it'll take the dollar value of dates of those losses, it'll put them in the bins, if you will, in this model. It'll then project those losses into the future over the next 100-year cycle, stopping at 2018 and working forward for 100 years, and it'll bend those losses into frequencies to say, OK, based upon these losses and dollar amounts and dates, we project for years it'll have this much flooding, and nine years it'll have this much flooding, and 20 years. The model does that on its own, and it'll project those dollar value losses and bring them back in today's dollars and say, that's your benefit. The history is gone once we tag those numbers and dates and dollar amounts. It projects as the future loss. Now, I'm almost done. If I use your depth in the floodplain, now we're really going to get technical, but not, not overly. The, your depth in the floodplain relative to the elevation of your home, I go into your central appraisal district record, and I say you got a 2,000 square foot home. I go into Marshall and Swift, the construction cost estimator, and I say that home's average cost repair is $84 a square foot based upon the type of construction. So I say that is $169,000 worth of at-risk structure. I don't think I did that math right, but it was close. Then the model will say, OK, if the home is sitting at 12 foot above mean sea level, and the 10-year event is at 14 foot above mean sea level, and the 10-year event gets two foot of water, the depth of water two foot on a, that size home is 14% damage. It'll project 14% damage in a four-year event. It'll bring that back to current value dollars. It keeps doing that every third of a year for 100 years and brings it back in today's dollars. That's what's inside of these models. I don't do anything other than know what needs to go into them, and the model generates all the details. And for that, you don't use the maps, the floodplain maps? Sure, the floodplain maps are what drives the depth of water, that BFE, the 10-year event, the 50-year event, the 100-year event, the 500-year event. Yeah. So if I've gone from in the 99 maps, I was in zone X, but I'm now getting flooded. 
below the 100 year flood line. You're, you are designated, you're going to flood, this is what this area is. I got you. Right? As of what we've talked about and all the other stuff, the other schools and whatever up to this point, we're talking about it, I guess, in the 99 maps, and it's saying that you're not going to flood. Got, got you. Is that going to be nope. carrying forward? Nope. Or do they take, take forward what the new maps are going to look like, and then how likely is that going to be flooded in the future? And so on. Gotcha. So you heard the. Um, the city manager say that we will work with you whatever we being the city I'm not the city the city will work with you in whatever way works best for you within the confines that they're limited to of course but very flexible on what they will and can do if so if you're in the preliminary map and they sub damned you and that is to your benefit to be sub damned for buyouts I keep going this way for some reason then that's what we're going to use for your eligibility if you're in the preliminary map or in the 1999 map, and I can't do a BCA in an X zone because I don't have the law, I don't have the flood depth information. They'll provide me the flood profiles using the most current maps, the preliminary maps, or the Harris County 2012 maps, and we'll run whatever works best because FEMA will accept it. So we'll, I will be able to run whatever proves us to have the highest benefit within the confines of what I'm allowed to do whatever is the highest benefit on your property and use that as our calculation. Likewise, if you're sub damned and you wanted buyouts and you're in a preliminary map and you come back to pull a permit and you no longer, and you say, I want to go back to the 99 maps, you may have lost your eligibility there, but I would imagine the city would consider looking at you again if you wanted to and hadn't yet repaired. But and we, we would, and we have already done that for a handful of y'all that didn't get their first buyout application that we had applied for and given you the opportunity to undo your so we're on your side. Okay. I know that sounds like a, a uh, slogan, but. One of the things that I didn't see you, you talk about before was whether or not we had FEMA insurance. I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. What, whether or not you had FEMA insurance uh, come, coming into You do not. So the question was, he didn't hear me talk about whether or not you had FEMA insurance. This hazard mitigation grant program does not have an eligibility requirement relative to being insured to the NFIP. You are eligible whether you have insurance, private insurance, or flood insurance, just the same. There is no requirement. The flood mitigation assistance program the city applied for was limited only to homes that have FEMA flood insurance because that program is funded through flood insurance policy premiums. This is disaster driven, no requirement. Did you have a question? At least. Three prior to Harvey. So Harvey would have to be your fourth? No, four, three with Harvey. In order to run, so again, without getting overly technical, but if I get nodding heads, which excites me when I talk math and people act like they know what I'm saying. So that's, that's always good. I'm a, I'm a little bit of a geek or a nerd, whatever one fits your taste better. Um, so the, the model will not calibrate. So when we put in dollar values and dates of losses, if I put in just two, it won't be able to predict the frequency of the event that caused those. When you put in three or more, it says, oh, okay, I got enough, I have rich enough data that I can say this was a 10,000, this was a 100,000, this was a 90,000 dollar loss. These were the dates. It'll say, okay, let's assume that was a 10 year event, this was a 100 year event, this was a, without three, the model doesn't calibrate. So when I say outside the map floodplain, I need at least three losses, Harvey and two others. The more, the merrier, then the model calibrates. Whether Not the more, the merrier, that sounds terrible, but. I can run a benefit cost analysis on you whether or not you're in the floodplain if I have historical losses of at least three. For any time frame, it could be 679. Doesn't matter. Yes. Now, I will say, because I, I want to caveat this, if it was only three since 1979, the likelihood of cost effectiveness goes down. Right. Mathematical one. So, yeah, so the question was when I talked about elevation, and the cost of elevation, I was saying the dollar per square foot. I, if I had a whiteboard, I'd do this better. What I mean to say, and it's my term, the, square, the, the dollar per linear footprint of the home. So a linear footprint, so you have a 4,000 square foot home that's two story, and you have the bottom level is 2,500 square foot, and the upper level is 1,500 square foot. If I did my math correctly, that's a 2,500 square foot vertical footprint. So the cost to elevate is driven off of the vertical footprint of the home. So a mistake that grant writers make 
is assuming a garage is detached when it's really embedded in the home and you got a 2,000 square foot footprint and a 500 square foot garage and you put in a grant for a 2,000 square foot lift, you missed 500 square foot and you're short $50,000 in your grant. Does that all make sense mathematically? So the vertical footprint drives the elevation cost. So the question was, if I had a home that's built where they finish the garage area or another part of the area into finished area, can I lift just the part that was the primary living area to begin with? If I got that correctly, we can absolutely detach a home and leave a garage on the ground. I think to be compliant, you'd have to abandon that living area that's behind or part of the garage in order for it to be compliant. You couldn't leave it as living area, elevate part of the home because FEMA would then say the lowest finished floor is a living area behind the garage or part of the garage. You'd have to abandon that in order for it to be compliant. Basically take out the pipe and the restroom, take out the living quarters, take out the... the you just make it a really big garage. Correct. Get some extra cars. The question was, when you send out the email, could you put City of Friendswood in the subject line or in the title, because some people don't open emails from people they don't know, nor do I, and he didn't know who he was and wanted to know his name and title. That is Patrick Donard. He's the city, city engineer. Spell the last name. D-O-N-A-R-T. Donard, I said it correctly, but I just didn't spell it because um, I didn't want to get it wrong. <laughs> uh, he's the city engineer, he's the public works director, and he's the city's floodplain administrator or manager. Correct. Administrator. Administrator. Cool. Thank you. Phew, I got all that right. Here and then there, I think. Back to the three times, or at least three times flooded, do you have to be in the home? No, ma'am. Well, the NFIP, so here, there's a number, uh, it's going to be hard for me to do this because I don't have the number off the top of my head. If you call your flood adjuster and ask for the loss history on your home, they should give it to you. So when we did the city of Houston's elevation application, we had the homeowners call the NFIP and get the loss history f directly from the NFIP and had all the prior losses on the home that they owned, they had to own the home, and it was more than they thought it had flooded, which was to the benefit cost analysis benefit. When will it close? You know, It'll close right after we submit the application. I'm sorry? You want to know when you'll have to provide the documentation to us? Well, I want to know when it closed. I need to go home. I need my home elevated. I, okay, I so, so I, understand, I understand your question. The question was, when will the application close is what the question was. And the answer is it's open today, and there is no end date yet established. So we can submit applications as soon as we have them finished for consideration. So we're going to start over from scratch on, on interest and eligibility. Uh, hold on, there was somebody else. Do you want to like physically go home right now and leave, or you want to go back into your home? Um, I'll come back, I promise. Yes, ma'am. If you get approved on an application, I don't mean now. Right. Absolutely. I will fit, want me or somebody from my team will physically sit down with you and go over everything. Okay. And then my second question is, is if you have a favorable, if you want to elevate and you have a favorable benefit or cost analysis, who selects the contractor that lives your house? You, FEMA, the city, who picks All right. So I'm going to tell you how it's done in other jurisdictions, but the city of Friendswood would help determine that. So, and I'm, I, I don't, this is, I have a standard operating procedure that I follow the state of Texas has liked up until now. This grant is managed by a different Texas agency than we're used to, but here's typically how it works. We go out for an RFQ to down select qualify financially stable contractors at homes. Usually three, four, five contractors in the pool of eligible contractors. They have to be financially stable. They have the performance bond and payment bond capabilities. They have to have proven track records of lifting homes. They have to have the proper equipment and manpower like unified jacking systems. We don't want any fly-by-night contractors that are not good elevation contractors and financially stable. We get them qualified through whatever RFQ process the city, the state, and, and the contractor agrees with. Then we put out bid specs 
high level bid specs. We meet with each of the homeowners and we say, okay, this home is 2,400 square foot footprint with a 400 square foot garage. The guy has to go up. The guy wants to detach his garage and abandon the lower level. We're going to have one form of ingress in the rear, one form of ingress in the back. We're going to put a catwalk around for the air conditioner. It's got to go up eight feet. All right, guys, everybody bid on these homes. Don't go to the contractors yet. Don't go to the homeowners yet. Bid on the homes. They bring the bids back to us. We review them for consistency. They all bid the same square footage and lift height and ingress and egress points. They're within our grant budget. We release them to you. We give the contractors two weeks or a week to meet with you and sell their services. You choose any one of those contractors that you want that's pre-selected, qualified, eligible, and good. And then we work an agreement with you and the city to pass along the terms of the grant and you enter a contract and you in a contract to elevate your home and you go to town. They full, pull the same permitted, same engineering. That's how I manage an elevation grant. It works very well. All of the performance bonds and payment bonds, if they default under a federal grant, the remedies are strong enough that your home still gets elevated. If the home God forbid, physically something happens to it, they have insurance to cover the full value of the home during the lift. So we pre-select eligible, financially stable, qualified contractors. We require they have performance bonds and payment bonds in case they fail during the job. And we make them pull all the same permits that they would otherwise require to pull and you get an elevated home. Hold on. All right. Uh, I just want to make sure that I'm clear because I'm considering elevating my home and I did not have flood insurance. I did have wind damage. I'm, I'm dealing with windstorm on, on that part of things now. But if I'm successful in getting what I need from them, technically I should be able to take care of my entire house. So if I wanted to use the grant money to help elevate it before I start uh, the repairs, is that possible or is because this meeting is only for elevating or buybacks, correct? As opposed to fixing your home? Yeah. Yeah, there's no grant that we're talking about that has anything to do with fixing your home. And the answer, the answer, the answer to your question, if it was a buyout, the wind insurance would be duplicative. If it's an elevation, it would not be. Um, there is more than one way to skin that cat. You're going to have to repair your home anyway. Can it be repaired before elevation? Absolutely. As long as you can get a permit to repair if it wasn't substantially damaged. Substantial damage in the floodplain is by any means not just by flood. Um, ironically enough, ICC is only eligible if it's by flood, not by wind, but that's a whole different issue. So we, it can go in either way. I find it more difficult to get through the process and get occupancy if, we, if you're not repaired before you elevate because then it ties up how, when are we closing the grant out and are you really gonna finish the work to do, get the occupancy permit? So if we spent $150,000 on federal funds to elevate your home and then you never did your uh, repair work, they're gonna come back and get your money back from you. So I find it's usually easier to do the repair work first. The, the structure repair work that's part of a non-elevated related activity and then elevate the... We can talk about it, we, we can talk about it. I mean, uh, each case is individual, but I'm just telling you, occupancy becomes a sticky wicket. The city would probably have to work out some very specific details where you would commit to do this or this would happen sort of thing if you elevated before you could get occupancy, meaning that you still had a ton of repair work to do after elevation. It's just a challenge. Prior to your loss, did they have to be a plane or can they be um, if you, the, the, so I'm sorry, prior, thank you, prior losses, do they have to be FEMA claims or can they be uninsured losses? If we can document the uninsured losses, they can be uninsured losses. If we can't document that we can't just take a letter from, word from you saying, hey, you know, back in, I'm not, not being facetious, back in 84, there was about $50,000 of the home. If you have damage receipts and repairs for that, we can do it. If you have uh, documented depth of water, we have a chance of looking at those, but we can't just say, I know it flooded here, here, and here, and it was about this much damage. It's not documented enough to use for BCA. Yeah, but hit, the moral to the story, as I said earlier on, keep every repair receipt that you spend on your home, no matter who paid for it. Oh, where were we? Yes, 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 ma'am. You first, and then you.
All right, so, okay, so you got, so the question, do you want me to repeat that question? All right, hold on. So the question was, she thinks, she, she's done the math that she thinks that she would probably qualify for biop because she got the subdam letter, but probably not for elevation because she's not deep enough. And I think that's a good takeaway. I mean, that, that's a good assessment probably. Um, but can I get an interim permit to do the interior repair work that I would need to do while I'm waiting for a buyout option? And um, the gentleman, Brad. Brad, sorry, I went to dinner with him and forgot his name. Um, said that come see him and he would see what he could do. Is that correct, Brad? She asked if I was considering selling my house as is, what happens with that building permit? And, and I don't know what the city's position with, that, with this would be, but I will say the grants are the home's grants, not the homeowner's grants. So uh, a subsequent buyer could potentially participate, but I will tell you right now they couldn't make any money off the program. They could only get back what they put in. So there's no real benefit to participating in the buyout program after buying a home from somebody that was kind of one of the we buy ugly homes deals doesn't help those investors at all. So who is Brad? It's Brian. Brian. Oh, did I say Brad? Brian? Brian. Brian, what's your last name again? You can Rowan. Brian Rowan. Go ahead. Brian's our building official and our deputy floodplain administrator, but you can con contact Rowan, R O U A N E. But you can communicate through Patrick. It's, it's fine. We'll give you his cell phone number, home address. No. <laughs> Patrick is the one that left? Yeah, well, he's still <laughs> the Yes, ma'am. If we didn't have flood insurance, what's another good way to pull the history of the flooding for the house? Do you think the house had flood insurance before you? Then we, if you give me the address, we can go to the state of Texas and get the loss history from them. By the way, if you were to give me an address and express interest and you were not substantially damaged, you're looking at me funny. That was a question. Well, then the flood loss history doesn't matter. That was the first 10 minutes of my discussion. Uh, but if the first thing I'm going to do is go to the state and ask for the claims database for the city of Friendswood to see what the loss history on the homes were in case you don't have it all. If they'll give it to me, and they typically will, then that'll help us also. Is each application submitted individually or is it a whole group? There is, let me be real clear on something. We're not, and I, it's, it's a point, we're down to a third of the people that was here before. We're not asking you to fill out an application. We're asking you to fill out a letter of interest. Application is an application in total that we do. There is no individual application. And the homeowner isn't, I just want to be clear, a lot of people think when they, they are dealing with FEMA, they are applying to FEMA for a grant. That's not the case. They're asking the city to apply for a FEMA grant on their behalf along with anyone else that may be interested. So what you'll get from the city is documentation that we need to do an application. And the first one is an expression of interest in being included on the application. Is that clear? That's still well, go ahead. So it doesn't have to be. I, so I think. I, so I think. So the question: If there there are ten people here that want to be submitted to the buyout program, is it all submitted at one time? So I'm going to paraphrase your question to say, we are already ruling an application. Why do we have to wait for everybody else to get back on another application? Okay. Um, so my opinion on that is, if we get an application together real quick or wait for other people, we'll submit that and then we'll do another one. I mean, that doesn't matter to me how we do it. That's up to the city. If the city council approves. We could submit 10 applications if we wanted to. It seems to be a waste because you have to manage them individually, which is a pain in the butt. But uh, I understand your concern. I think the city's going to put reasonable timelines on people. If you take away nothing else, the city's willing to help. But if you sit around and drag your feet, we'll move on without you. Is that fair? So I'm going, to, I'm going to make it a suggestion that Mo will back up. If you haven't gotten a subdam letter yet, come into the city and look for that. And if you don't get in the buyout, then work with the city to see if you can provide enough documentation to show that that is something they can reverse. 
And you were on our original buyout list, so you were substantially damaged. However, now that we didn't get the, the buyout, if you wanted to undo that, we would find a way to work with you. And, and I'm going I'm to say we're going to have to get some additional documentation, but we'll start with that. If you express interest in the application, but you're going to, I would say, fill out the forms that we're going to submit, that we're going to submit in this email from Patrick, not the ones you submitted before. I'll go into that system and gather everything else and then work with you individually to see if we're missing anything. Because they're two different applications. They require a little bit different, unfortunately, associated with that. So um, I anticipate, what was I going to say? I will, see, I'm getting tired now. I know. Don't remind me. Yeah, so you glazed over construction. Uh, mitigation or reconstruction. Mitigation reconstruction. So what are the eligibility requirements for that? And you said, well, it's going to be more cost. It's going to cost more for the homeowner and this and that, so it's not a good idea. But what are the eligibility requirements for it, even though they are? The benefit cost analysis, which is exactly the same as elevation. I didn't mean to glaze over it. I'm just suggesting to you that after running them, and I'll discuss it, they are very complicated programs to get approved. Now, having said that, if you said to me, I know my BFE, I'm two foot below, I'm going to tell you, we can discuss it, but there's no way you're ever going to be cost effective. I know that. That's intuitive. There's no, mathematically, that's the case. So it's more expensive to demolish and rebuild a home than it is to elevate a home. Unless the home, well, that's true. I mean, it's dollar per square foot. It's more expensive to, ele to demolish and rebuild a home than it is to elevate a home. The demolition part of a home is, has to include any asbestos abatement that's required and full cost of demolition of the structure, removal of that structure. Then we start the building process on elevated structure, which is similar to elevating this foundation system, which is the primary cost of the cost of elevation. Then they have to build the compliant structure. It can be no more than 110% of the original air conditioned living square footage of the primary structure for which we demolished. So all I meant to say was, Typically, unless you downsize, it's more expensive to demo and rebuild a home than to elevate that same home. Because your elevation requirements are going to be exactly the same when you're done. You've got to be at the same uh, distance above BFA. So if, oh, let me finish. If it costs more money, the benefits are going to be the same. Because if you're here in a floodplain and you've got to go to here in a floodplain, the benefits are going to be the same. If it costs more, your BCA is going to be less. That's all I really meant to say. What's your follow-up? Well, okay, so let's take that into consideration. I don't factor any cost of repairing the interior of the home in a benefit cost analysis for an elevation. I only factor in the cost of elevation. Cost of interior repairs are yours. I'm trying to make a cost effective project, not determine how much you're going to be out of pocket. So if you did not have flood insurance and you have a damaged structure, it's probably going to cost you less money to demolish and rebuild that structure than to refix and elevate that structure. I'll give you that. But it's not going to cost the grant any, it's going to cost the grant more money to demo and rebuild than to elevate because the grant's not going to pay for any interior repairs on your elevation. But the grant covers up to 150K and then the cost to elevate is more than that, even at 75%. The grant does, has no limitations on elevation. It's a really straight, so here's, and I'll get to your question. Right. So that's more than 150. And 150 is your mitigation reconstruction. That's that's the FEMA federal limit on only the, that's the only amount of money they'll put into a demo rebuild. Less than 300,000. Why wouldn't that be in the grant? Because the cost effectiveness is based on the total project cost, regardless of federal share. There's the missing link. FEMA says if you're going to do a BCA, tell me what it's going to cost in total to demolish and rebuild that structure. $500,000 to demo and rebuild that 3,000 square foot structure, that's my cost. We'll give you 150, but my cost is 500,000. Total cost, not federal share, is what drives the, B, the C of the BCA. It's not my rules. So I understand your question now, 150 federal share is a lot less than 300,000, therefore why wouldn't the BCA be double, relatively speaking? It's because FEMA says, I don't care what we're giving you, I care what it's gonna cost in total to demolish and rebuild that structure. 
Now we're going to limit it to 150. It's a really, we have fought with FEMA for the past eight years since they came out with mitigation reconstruction to say, at a minimum, make them the same federal cap. Why would you make demo rebuild, fully compliant elevated structure, and not elevating a damaged structure or a structure that's 50 years old? Why wouldn't you, at a minimum, make the cost federal share the same? Tell me, we'll tell you what it's going to cost to elevate and give me the same amount of money to demo rebuild. And they said, nope, we don't want the perception in the press or anywhere else that federal funds are being used to build mansions in Friendswood. So they limit the federal share to 150. They have no limit on the federal share for elevation or buyouts. <laughs> bought the house, it took it out of the floodplain so we did not have to have flood insurance. Now then, since we flooded and had three feet into the house, what I call the flood insurance, which is not required to have, they tell me I'm in now in a special zone. So you use your map for your purposes when you submit it, but what are the regulations when I go to, to get flood insurance? Before, I didn't have to have flood insurance. Can, can I, well, I have a really important point that I want to note. You're living in a home that was elevated with FEMA grant funds before you bought it. Sure. You have a deed restriction on your property that forces your purchase of flood insurance in perpetuity for the life of that structure. If you didn't buy flood insurance when you bought the property, you're not eligible for any federal assistance. Oh, and, and that's fine, but I, I, don't, I don't want to buy it. I'm just telling, no, 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 any federal assistance, including flood insurance payments. You have to buy flood insurance, I mean, in federal, in federal grants, because when you bought that home, there is a deed restriction that was recorded with that home that said, this home was, I do them, this home was elevated with federal grant funds, therefore, flood insurance is required in perpetuity on that structure for the life of the structure. <laughs> the title company, absolutely. I closed on the house, bought the house, and had it years. That's why you have title, the title company absolutely is going to be required to take care of that, absolutely. So. I would go after the title company because there is a deed restriction filed on that property that said that you are, that you are put on notice. And the owner knew it, by the way, because was when we presented to the owner, they're required to buy flood insurance and any subsequent owner is required to maintain flood insurance for the life of the structure. And it's a deed restriction that, had, that was filed with Galveston County and was on that lot. I did those buyouts. I mean, I did those elevations. How did they, how did they miss that? The title company missed it. There's a, di by the way, I'm not, I have no doubt that if it were a home that wasn't elevated with FEMA grant funds, I, I don't, your, your EC would have, I, I have an argument with the, the concept that says I'm in a floodplain, but I'm elevated, therefore I don't need flood insurance. That's a different argument than my flood insurance is going to be really inexpensive, but let's not go there yet. Let's go down the path of your, your require, they were required to buy flood insurance regardless of the, its elevation. It's a deed restriction on that property that is recorded with the deed. I know it. I've seen them. So my only point to you is go back to the title company. No, the title company slipped it through the, through the cracks. It's not the city. You don't go to the city to buy a house. There are no paperwork that's filed with the city on the purchase of a home, so there's nothing for us to look at when you purchase the home. The title company is supposed to identify all encumbrances on the tract, including the deed restrictions, and they provide you and you pay for a title insurance policy as part of the closing of the home. That insurance policy is what's supposed to cover what situation you're in right now. So you can file a claim against that title insurance. And I would go pull your deed from the county and, and look for the deed restriction that I'm referring to. It's on there. Substantial damage? Right, right. Um, and they went through the buyout process, but then when it came to uh, deciding on the price of the home, they, it felt that they didn't uh, agree on that. So then, is that homeowner eligible for elevation? Yeah. So I probably have been doing a great job of repeating the questions. Um, they were substantially damaged. They want to know if they go down the buyout path and then don't come to an agreement to sell the home, would they then be eligible for elevation? The grant will be buyout or elevation. We can't switch back and forth between that. 
Could you go through the whole buyout process and later, if you were to meet the benefit cost analysis, apply for a future elevation grant if the city chose to do one? There would be no restriction against doing that, but Lord only knows when that may open up. It wouldn't be part of Harvey because we would be beyond the Harvey application window before that would even come up. And you can have, never have a home on two applications, meaning buyout and elevation for the same funding source. You can go back to the buyout again. Okay. Yeah, and I, I didn't say this before, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. And I don't, it sounds like a lot of people that are remaining here were part of that first FMA uh, buyout program application. Uh, if I didn't say it before, I'm going to say it now, or I'll, I'll make it a firmer statement now. That is a very competitive, now she competitive application. The application friends would put in was a very thorough and complete application with a very small window to do so after Harvey. So the applications were due pretty much as Harvey was hitting. And the FEMA national office didn't move any window. They didn't move any timelines. They didn't, it was a national competition. They didn't necessarily, necessarily care what happened in Texas relative to every other state in the country applying for that money. That application did well. It just fell below the funding line because there were so many applications nationwide against a very small pot of money. Mathematically, 150 million nationwide compared to 1.1 billion in Texas alone. I wouldn't get discouraged by that. Not, I mean, we, we, I, did an, I didn't work on the Friendswood application, but that's not to say I didn't work on applications this year that weren't funded. City of Houston application I did wasn't funded. One of them was, one of them wasn't. Several applications in Texas that were quality applications, including Friendswood, didn't make that hurdle because there's so limited funding available nationwide. So please don't get discouraged by that. This is a better opportunity. And that appraisal that in the buyout program, that's fair market value. Pre-flood fair market value, yes, ma'am. Does the cost analysis for elevation take into account the type of foundation you have? Uh, we, there's a, so the answer is yes. We, we keep trying to tweak and tweak and tweak that methodology on how to determine the most the best way to, to budget for cost effectiveness. So we found that the factors are primarily whether it's slab on grade or currently pier on beam and we need to detach the uh, home from the pier system and elevate it. Uh, whether it's one story or two story, whether it's brick or wood frame and then how high it needs to go, you get certain push points that cost more money as you go up. There are some unusual homes, like in, in Beaumont, there's some homes that are sitting on concrete block. They're going to be very inexpensive to elevate because they can literally just put your piling, your uh, I-beams through and lift it up. There's really very little prep work or mobilization work. So the trick to elevations after having done many applications, running an elevation program is easier than trying to figure out how much it's going to cost to elevate a home without engineering done. So the answer to your question is if, if we are looking at a specific home, we'll gather as much data as we can. And I typically will talk to three or four contractors and say, this is a unique home with this kind of situation. What do you think we should be using for budgetary purposes? But if it's a standard slab on grade home, we got that pretty well under control for estimating costs. But if it's something unusual, then we would look at it separately. Well, that's a good question. I'm only determining in that in the benefit cost analysis, the primary portion I was talking about, and I don't want to get pats on the back. It's not as simple as just inputting stuff into the, I'm trying to simplify it as much as possible so that it is easy to understand for the general people and people are much more savvy in engineering and math than others. Um, but if you have a cost estimate, that's the seaside. The benefit cost model will predict the benefits, but the cost number is a, one, is a single number. So when we generate a benefit cost analysis on elevation, I may put together a spreadsheet that says this much square foot, this high of a lift height, this is the type of thing. And my estimate with project management and engineering and permitting is $213,000 to lift that home. But if you have a cost estimate now that you already have to elevate your home and you want me to use that as the seaside, that's okay, but 
if we, we're not going to use your contractor, and, they, and by the way, I would say it's more expensive to elevate a home under a FEMA-funded program than individually because we have so many more requirements of performance bonds and payment bonds and insurance and the quality of the contractors and financial stability. You could probably get a guy to come lift your home that doesn't have a great deal of experience or maybe a guy that has a huge amount of experience that would charge less because he's not in a federally funded program. He doesn't know when he's going to get paid the same. The draw schedules are different. They buffer it a bit more. So um, they know they can get change orders in your program. If they start tunneling your home and they find this, you know, half the slab doesn't have reinforcement, they're going to come back to you because their contract said they could and they ask you for another $50,000. We don't allow that. So they are different cost estimates, but I could use your cost estimate as a starting point. It just may not be the actual cost in the grant. So if we submit our supply company, or the company we got to our estimate has worked with you before. So we submit to you when you meet the four our benefit cost analysis on our individual basis, and then you will tell us at that meeting or you know, let, let me clarify. I'm not meeting with anybody oh. one-on-one for benefit cost analysis. Uh, you can submit your cost estimate. I'm not, I'm not, if you're asking me, here's my dilemma. I need enough money in the budget for the grant to cover the cost of elevation in the competitive environment when we hire an elevation contractor. That may not be the same as your cost. So if I use your cost and we get it approved and then it goes up by $50,000 and you're the only home on the grant, we can't elevate your home with the grant. So it's kind of a, a, a crapshoot on, and, and by the way, I've seen, I can give you three or four examples of a contractor in our FEMA funded programs, elevating homes in Maryland, that is charging half what we're charging because he's not doing anything but lifting the homes. So it really depends on what they're really doing. So I'll look at it if you'd like to, but I, um, I don't know how to answer the question any different than, No, 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 no. You, we don't qualify now. You'll know right as soon as I do the benefit cost analysis on what do you, whether you qualify. So, as soon as we get the email, then we'll submit our information. And then we'll start working on BCAs, yep. And you'll know right away. I mean, you, you should be able to go through some of the math in your head, though, because I've gone through it a couple of times. If you know your, your elevation of your home, the current elevation, and you know what the required elevation is, if you tell me, let me ask you a question. How high is your elevation contractor proposing to lift you? I'm sorry. How high is your elevation? How many feet is he lifting you? For yeah, you won't be cost effective for the FEMA grant. I can guarantee you that. It's not deep enough in the floodplain. You only have a, you're only two foot under BFA. The model will not generate enough benefits. I'll run it for you to prove it to you, but it's unfortunate as hell. The homes that are cost effective are going up between eight and 12 feet, not four feet. And by the way, some of those have no freeboard. Meaning you're going, you really only have to go up, you're only two foot only, good, that's a lot, only two foot below BFA. I would say you probably got to be down a six, seven, eight, nine foot below BFA and have to go up eight, ten feet higher than you currently are in order to meet the FEMA benefit cost analysis requirements. The only caveat to that would be looking at the preliminary math to see if you need to go higher than four feet. But. Right. Somebody, oh, you, I promised you I keep going away from you. So I was set with damage, and uh, so when the flood maps changed from 07 away to 99, it reverted me back to a better standing. So they gave me the option to build back or stay substantially damaged. So I knew I wasn't going to be at the top of the list to get a buyout or anything, so I opted to go ahead and build back. But we want to do the buyout, so can I be eligible for that now? I'm about 70% complete in building the house. Uh, so, and if I am, what do I need to do? Can I be reimbursed? I have all the receipts, but what do I need to do going forward? Did Did you have flood insurance? No. You could do it. Well, if the city was willing to reverse your substantial damage determination, you could not be reimbursed because there's no deduction. There wouldn't be a deduction of pre-flood value. So the only time we can do duplication of benefits credit for repairs is if we're doing a deduction for flood insurance received for those repairs. So you're in an interesting situation. Well, it is a situation you maintain substantial damage. The map simply changed so you weren't required to elevate. With basically the, the brass tax involved. Correct. But, but yeah. Going back, it, yes, it, it put me in a better state. Going forward, I'm still below 
I understand we can only actually a couple inches so, above Facebook. So I, th I think what I'm hearing is that you, because you, we have a substantial damage determination letter on you, I think the city is suggesting that we could include you in an HMGP application for a buyout, but your dilemma will be we can't credit you for the incurred expenses of the repairs because we have no deduction and in flood insurance and we would exceed the appraised value if we were to credit you repairs on a pre-flood value without any deductions. Right. And the, the grant, as the Jeff had enumerated earlier, is not 100%, it's at 75%, so you're already behind the curve <coughs> at the offshoot, so you're gonna, everyone's gonna have to weigh that option and that risk moving forward. One of the things I say to homeowners in these situations is the city is willing to pass along 100% of what they receive from FEMA. So, I mean, they are giving you everything. I mean, not keeping any of the money. Um, they would, they're gonna pay for the application development out of pocket for, with city funds. They're gonna, they're gonna cover some of the administrative costs of running the grant that aren't specific to a property. But everything else they get is gonna, and that's out of the city pocket, so I'm gonna ask you for that. Everything else they get is gonna be um, passed along to you from FEMA. Anything they get from FEMA will be passed along to the homeowners penny for penny. You know, you know, I didn't say that earlier, and I know we keep whittling down. I say, I keep saying that, and people that have left aren't going to hear this, but maybe they'll listen to this. I always say to folks, and it's not because I want to run buyout programs. I'll do a ton of buyouts and elevations from Harvey. So, I'm, you know, if, if no one in this room uh, participates, that's to your advantage or disadvantage, not to mine. So, I, I, they have no vested interest in this statement. I always say to homeowners, hear the offer. Get in the program, hear the offer. It's voluntary, there's no negative. You can, you would, they won't cancel your flood insurance. You're still eligible to apply for future grants. You get a free appraisal out of it. Maybe it makes sense to you. Maybe there'll be another flood, God forbid. But what if you declined and then, then there was another flood? We did the Friendswood and Paraland buyout in 2001. And while we were doing the buyout and people declined it, the home, uh, October 2002, the whole area flooded again, spotty, but flooded again. And people that declined came back and said, God, I wish I hadn't declined. But they had, they had already moved on and we had closed out the grant. So there's no harm in participating in the program. Decline the offer if it's not enough. Um, so you Yeah, it's not quite that simple. Um, the tool that I have on uh, to do the benefit, it's the benefit cost analysis. I have to plug the cost in in order for the model to run too, by the way. So it's the benefit cost analysis model. Can we, is that available online and we can run it ourselves? The answer is it is available online. If you go to FEMA.gov and type in benefit cost analysis, you can download the software. Um, if you can work through it, that's fantastic. There are a lot of complications in how to work through it and things you have to put in. If you do try to do it, if you use the DFA, the Damage Frequency Assessment Model, it's a lot easier to use. That's a loss history model. I don't think you'd be able to run the flood module on your own because it requires engineering data inputs into it. But if you could, that, you know, more power to you. But yes, you can download those models from the FEMA website and try to run the BCAs on your own. I don't know that I agree with your situation. So here, here's the question that always goes through my mind in a post-flood environment. Is 75% of a damaged home better than 100% or nothing? So I, I said that in a weird way, but you're damaged. You may not be able, there may not be any market for the home. I've run into areas where, Friendswood's different, of course. So 75% of a pre-flood value of a home may be worth more by far than the home is worth today. So to say, I don't care if you're not in the buyout program, but to say it's better for me to flood and flood again, I remember meeting with a homeowner either in Friendswood or Paraland in 2001. He had flooded 17 times, and I said, why now? And he said, I just got tired of flooding. 
I can't do this anymore. Well, why did it take 17 floods to get tired of flooding? I mean, I had my water, my pipe, pipes burst in Virginia two years ago, and it took me two months to recover, and all that happened, $13,000 of damage, that's it, because my pipes burst. But all the walls had to be taken out, the pipes replaced. I can't imagine what you guys go through. So if it's worth the pain, it's, by the way, the FEMA modules, in addition to what you'll be able to figure out, we are able to input in disruption, displacement, and impact on people's lives emotionally and work-wise into these models. I can't imagine what you're going through. So to hear someone say, well, it's I could probably be better off flooding out time and time again. I don't know if there's anything that would allow me to say I'm better off flooding time and time again if you were gonna get a fair amount of money and a pre-flood value for a damaged property. But that's financially your call. And, and I apologize for the situation you're in, but we don't write these rules. These are federal, federal guidelines. And all I can say is I'm sorry. Yeah. I wouldn't use over again. I grew up in What? I mean, FEMA's probably paid over a million dollars on the home that my dad grew up in. And, it's, and it just sold as it is. Well, yeah, I'm surprised if they paid that kind of money. Now, I went over the benefit cost analysis modules for lost history. If it's paid that kind of money, it's likely would have been cost effective depending on the value of the home. So the loss history, I say three losses, but if it had six or seven losses, that's when you start to get into the volume of, yeah, it's going to be cost effective. So um, I recommend two things. Let us run the BCA on your home. I'm not gonna, all, all I was trying to do was I didn't want people to come in here in this meeting and think they were going to leave and get an elevated home. I want to try to set the expectations on how difficult it is to qualify them. But I think we'll run every home BCA and, and the city will give you the results of that benefit cost analysis if you'd like. And you could even try to run it yourself if you'd like. But um, it may be worth it. You may find it you are cost effective. And if you're substantially damaged, then you don't need, even need to do the BCA. Come in and visit with Brian, our building official. Have you tried to pull a permit? What have you, or since Harvey, what, what's your current situation? Are you living in the home or are you living? No, no, we've been living elsewhere. Okay. Are you, have you come in to pull a permit? Have you filed an insurance claim? We didn't have insurance. Have, do you have an estimate on repair costs? No. Come visit Brian. Okay. Brian. Yeah, there's a sign-in sheet about just outside on the... That is the applying for the buy? No, ma'am. They will send you an email with the documents you need to return to us in order to get on the list for consideration for the buy -out. You don't need to see Brian. She told her to see Brian. most likely not substantially damaged unless we have a lot of claim data. Uh, it's this is my fourth one. Their house is torn down all around. And then we don't have to worry about substantial damage. Jeff will run the cost-benefit analysis based on your prior flood losses, not on your substantial damage threshold. Uh, so do I sign this tonight? Please. And this is just so that we can get you any information that uh, we're going to solicit information from you in order to run these analyses. And for everybody, it's going to be okay. unique. And I have to I can't stress enough that there's no, most likely there's not going to be any two homes that are going to be equivalent. Everyone's going to have a unique story, so I can't make a blatant mistake here and tell you that you're going to have the same result. So for y'all, please go see Brian, and we can see what we can to work with you. You're probably not substantially damaged, but what we can do is run your cost benefit analysis based on prior flood losses. Okay. So and, uh, make sure we have your name on that list right here. Okay. Yes, sir. For the grant qualification does is the higher flood levels considered or does it ignore it when they look at the BFP? Are you asking me if the prior flood depth of water from historical floods is looked at? Yes, since the flood levels were greatly exceeded the BFP. Did you have a claim associated with those? Yes. 
Well, then that's what would be looked at, the dollar value of those claims. And the deeper the water, the higher the dollar value of claims, and that would then drive the benefit cost analysis. So there are two ways to do the VCA, loss history or flood depth. So if we look at depth of water in the floodplain, and you've got, you, you, know, you have these 800-year events that are flooding your home, likely the loss history is going to be a more productive uh, benefit cost analysis than the depth of the floodplain because we're having these very unusual events that are exceeding the 100-year event level. So there's more than one method, okay. There's more than one way to do it. Okay. Say a loss history, I have a really bad loss history. I uh, went through processes and uh, we've had three major events on the hall. Uh, we just built a first buyout in Allison. So uh, we missed, everybody bought out around me. Years later, I found out that they had a wrong address. We got corrected of that on the same paper. Okay, we got we brought it in. Well, they had a racing program. They missed me on that program, too. They said that it wasn't on the same paper. I got it corrected again. Do you have, do you have flood insurance? Oh, yeah. Now? Yeah. Did you receive a substantial damage letter from the city? Yes. Okay, then you're qualified. But we got to make sure we have your right address. Yeah, that's about 301, 301 West Castlewood Avenue. Were you substantially damaged at this time in Harvey? Did you receive a substantial damage determination letter for Harvey? What? Well, we solicited folks that were interested just to notify us that immediately after Harvey. We reviewed the flood plans that were filed following Harvey to determine uh, substantial damage. We looked at a variety of different outlets. Um, but it, it wasn't a, a fail-safe, one-size-fits-all. So if you're not on the list, we'll get you on the list right now. Well, I, I just um, wrote my name on the back, but I was just curious why. Because it's, it's not 100%. We, 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 every time it rains more than two inches, we flood. That's part of the creek overflow. How, how, how much water did you have in from this, your house from Harvey? Harvey. Okay, you were not substantially damaged right. then, so we wouldn't have reached out to you to notify you about this. Well, and the one that you were just referring to, only substantially damaged homes were included. And that would have been five foot of water, not. It doesn't mean that you're not qualified for these programs. Right. If we didn't reach out to you for the first application for buyout, you would not have <laughs> for what we applied for. <coughs> but this is a whole different set of requirements now. So about that limit elevation, if we're putting a building, a uh, fully new house, and we were put, uh, put in uh, 60 inches, <coughs> and our contractor, or our architect wants us to build a house 10 feet above the base of elevation, would we still qualify for 150000 or it really depends on what our house is at right now? I'm trying to understand your question. Uh, I think the, the, question the short answer is no, because they're going to look at the regula regulations relative to the floodplain map. So if your architect wants to far exceed the federal requirements for elevation, that's a personal choice on y your part. Yes, ma'am. I spoke with a representative from the NFIP at one point, and he had mentioned that in Louisiana they made some of these programs retroactive to reimburse people that were pro proactive and moving along the process. Have you ever heard of a program in Texas? Like I've never heard of a program. Uh, I, so the question was that they, she spoke to an NFIP person in, that worked in Louisiana that... All right, so, so let me make an assumption, which I told you before I do a lot of. I'm going to make the assumption that was not a FEMA pot of money or HMGP. Um, the, the governor of Louisiana, after Katrina, 
established go, um, the Road Home program, and it brought in multiple funding sources from multiple. It had CDBG money, it had HMGP money, it had Global Match money, it had um, NCRS money. I mean, they were. I worked in Louisiana after Katrina for a short period of time. FEMA programs, first of all, if you put a shovel in the ground before you get funded by FEMA, you're ineligible because you didn't meet any of the environmental evaluations if your home had been historic. So I doubt very seriously that that Louisiana program, I may be wrong, was anything that we're talking about today, the funding that was retroactive. There may be some funding source in Texas that's coming in this disaster or future that's retroactive reimbursing, but not HMGP. So. I'm not sure what that was, but I wouldn't be surprised if there was one. I just don't know what the funding source would be. The street could outlive um, there is a substantially damaged property list already out. And there's 14 homes listed on it. And I wasn't aware that I mean and ask for a buyout and I'm not on that list. The the list that was printed in the Chronicle, uh, the Galston Daily News article was not worth its weight in the It was. It, it was a list based on an initial FEMA inspection, doing an exterior inspection without any interior data. So what have you done since Harvey? Have you tried to move back in your home? No, it's, there's been nothing done. Have you uh, talked with the contractor about cost estimates to rebuild? Well, partially. I'm going to that deeper because I have somebody that kind of yanked the rug out from underneath me, you know what I mean? Yeah, and I... And I apologize for that. We immediately after the storm, even though we waived all, all fees, we still required contractors to register with us so that you didn't end up in a situation where you had a fly-by-night contractor. Uh, similar to the, this couple over here, I'd encourage you to go see Brian and to discuss more details relative to your home. So also, I signed up for denial. I just interested in a buyout. Yes, ma'am. But I didn't indicate that out there. You'll get a form that asks you what you're interested in as part of what Patrick sends out. Do I still need to go ahead and talk with Brian? It would not hurt to talk with Brian, um, but Brian and Patrick are to become your two best friends over the next few months. Well, and I, to reiterate, if you are substantially damaged, then that qualifies you for buyouts. Being interested in the buyout still means you gotta, we got to make sure you're eligible for the buyout, and that would give you eligibility if you otherwise were substantially damaged and just hadn't found out yet. All right, are we done? Yay.